Yeah, um, well, uh, first of all, I've got to mention it's the uh, classic Tales of Yes tour. It actually kicks off in Europe on the 15th. I think it's in Lisbon. There are tickets still on sale. I'll put a purchasing link. I'll put a link to that just below this video. I'm curious to know, is, is how difficult is it to actually compile a Yes set list these days? Um, well, Steve usually has a heavy hand in that because he's, you know, we yield to that wisdom, so to speak. And then we have our say about just throwing an idea in from this album or that album. Um, and it's funny how some of these things come about. For instance, the last tour we did uh, an edited version of Silent Wings of Freedom. Okay. I've been dying to play that with the band, you know. <laughs> so at Soundcheck, I would show up and I've got the sound ready and the parts and I just noodle on it. And, and then, you know, the drums join in with me and and it kind of implants this seed, if you will. So there's there's many ways that it comes about. You know, Steve eventually looked at me and went, let's play that. I thought, cool, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of answered my next question. And that is, is, is there any, are there any specific yes uh, songs in the back catalogue that, that you haven't played yet that you would love to play? Um. Well, we were going to do a relay or tour, but COVID kind of and all the things that came along with that and the war and everything kind of derailed a little bit of that concept. Um, but I would love to play To Be Over and Sound Chaser, which I had quite down quite well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, that, that would be one that I'd like to do. I haven't done yet. Sound Chaser, To Be Over. Yeah, I think you know a lot of us were looking forward to to seeing the relay played in its entirety. Maybe there's something you can resurrect a little yeah. bit further up the road. Yeah. Um, how much of um, how much of this new album is going to feature in the in the set list? Out of interest. Well, we we are uh, playing "Cut from the Stars," which was the sort of first release from it. Yeah. Um, that's really it on this tour. You know, I mean, I'd I'd love to play. Spirit of the Skies is is the uh, the finest track on this album, in my opinion, of course. Yeah, it's epic. You know, it's it's in there with that yes feeling, and I would love to do that stuff. But the set lists get devised in these ways where we we are where we are. Um, but Cut from the Stars plays really well on stage. I can tell yeah. you that it's a great song to play. Great energy. Yeah, I mean, there's um listening to this album. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff on here that I'd like little nods to uh, classic yes. I'm presuming that was intentional. Um, were you listening particularly to the um, Going for the One album a lot when you were putting this record together? Well, I, you know, I love that record and it's always in my head. And I, I don't I don't I wouldn't say I was listening to any one thing as much as, you know, when you start playing something and you're writing for a yes record, you kind of know, I, for instance, whenever I'm, I produce a lot of records. So when I'm sitting around getting a bass sound, for instance, for a project that has nothing to do with yes, I start noodling on a little thing, which is where Cut From The Stars came from, that bass riff. Yeah. And as I played it, I thought, oh, this feels like that kind of thing. So, you know, let's let's start working on that. And and then along the way, the inspirations come, you know, for me, for grooves in my mind of past yes tracks and and just ways to touch on those emotions without plagiarizing, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. With something new. But definitely borrowing from the mother sauce in terms of the vibes of things and and uh, I'm always referring to to going for the one in my talks with the guys parallels the way the two part harmonies work from the get you know that was kind of a thing for me uncut from the stars oh. sort of you know along those lines of this two part thing right out of the gate and so you think of them in those ways I would say but not not so much in a in a you know I want to rewrite parallels today kind of a way because that would never work. You know? Was Parallels an influence then on the uh, Cut from the Stars uh, track? For me personally, yeah, that that one was, and 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 sort of a bit of Silent Wings. The way the bass line, you know, as you're playing Silent Wings, is sort of moving from the low end of the bass and sailing up to the top parts with this melody that weaves through. And so those thoughts go through my head as I'm I'm trying to think of things along those lines. Yeah, yeah. Cause, I mean, the the tour is actually called. Uh... Uh, classic tales of yes with a, a slight nod and a wink to tales from topographic ocean because i saw the last tour you play close to the edge in its entirety i remember leaving thinking, oh, they didn't touch upon topographic oceans at all so i'm pres i'm kind of presuming that's a hint that it's going to be covered on, on this tour yeah uh but i'm, I'm curious as to uh, uh how you feel about that album because it's it's seen uh you know fans argue about this record all the time and uh do, on any level do you agree with rick wakeman's criticism that it would have been a better single album 
Uh, no, because, you know, I have a certain place in my heart for that record. You know, when I was a kid and discovered, yes, Close to the Edge was the first thing. Um, you know, my brother playing me the album, uh, Jimmy Hahn and my friend Jimmy and Mike were best friends. They play me Close to the Edge. I didn't understand it at all and, and didn't really get into it. And then a couple of weeks later, I walked by the room and went, wait a minute, something's happening here. And then I had this, you know, conversion into being a diehard Yes fan that I remain. The next album that I really dove into was Tales of Topographic Oceans. Yeah. Uh, and I was just immersed in the music and the sort of adventure of the music and thinking as I'm looking at this record, God, there's, no, there's, there's only one place to start here. And then you can <laughs> let this whole thing go yeah. times four, plus the artwork of Roger Dean, which was incredible. I mean, as you know, Rick has a different take on it of course because he was there making it and uh, the one thing i've found through being around yes for as long as i have now is that you know you you have an impression of the album you're really involved with and then there's the perception of what the fans think about it and and then from there it kind of goes all over the place every album is almost controversial in its way yeah and, and so i i can see where rick's coming from uh, from the, his point of view and i respect that but as a person who just was like taken away to a musical Disneyland, you know, in headphones, looking at an album cover. You know, there was no internet. We didn't know what these guys looked like. <laughs> Just listening to it all, it was magical. Yeah. And so that that remains actually one of my favorite records in the catalog, ironically. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's my it's my go-to Yes album, really. It's the, always the one that I, I pick, because as you use the word immerse, it is, it's quite apt, really, because you just drift away on it, really. It's fabulous. Yeah. Interesting you talk about no internet in those days. I mean, I was a Pink Floyd fan for many, many years, and for many, many years, I had no idea what these guys actually looked like. Well, isn't that funny? I mean, a lot of our favorite bands growing up, we didn't really know what... I never knew what Gentle Giant really looked like. And, you yeah. know, I saw... Fortunately, I saw their last show... Wow. Uh, fortunately, because they stopped, uh, but fortunately, because I got to see it at the Roxy in Los Angeles in 1980. It was amazing. But yeah, the the visceral reaction of music to the album cover and the illusions in your mind, the, the visions in your head, you know, the, those those days have left us and now we live in a different era. But the music remains and people are transported back to that time. I know I am when I listen to it. You know, I'm just transported right back there. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I mean, you've got a fascinating stage design that you're you're working with at the moment. Uh, for what I've seen, if it looks like it's kind of a rotating thing, is that well, right? What? Um, no, I'm, I'm not so much. Maybe the way that it looks because of the the sides, the way they come in, it gives it a spherical sort of feeling to it. But it's funny you mentioned going for the one because I used when we were talking about production on this latest tour runs that we've yeah. been on. You know, I, I had kind of mentioned to the guys, you know, the, the LED screens that we've had forever, which while amazing to look at, mm -hmm. I was taken back to the first Yes show that I saw, which was going for the one, funny yeah. enough to mention that. And and the minimalism of the stage, but it was like these guys were set in a scene that just made you really tune into the music. And so I kind of brought this concept to the band of like, what if we go back to that style and, and get it back to where the music is really the focus and not so much the production side of it with, with walls of LEDs. And so, you know, one thing leads to another and here we are. And I think it works quite well. And, and it sort of gives it for me anyway, the lack of a better word would be like a vintage type of feel, which I think adds to the experience of seeing a yes show, you know, yeah, yeah. we all go want to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I've I've seen you play live, and I, I listen to the way you play. You seem you're very much heir apparent to uh, Chris Squire, uh, un undoubtedly. Uh, do you remember the last? What was the last conversation you actually had with Chris? Mm. Well, the last couple of weeks were the same sort of conversations. Not so much to talk about those things again, but just to make contact, yeah. you know, and, and speak. And it always came down to you know. I trust you with this. And I would always say to him, you know, you're going to make it through this. Don't, you know, I'll see you on the other side of this. Don't worry. I never imagined he was going to go, you know, cause I knew my, one of my managers from back in the day had some leukemia issue and bone marrow transplant and, and he's still alive and living. So in my mind, I was like, this is beatable, you know, Chris, you're going to be fine. And then he would bring it back to, okay, but listen, you know, do this, make sure yes is going. And, you know, he'd always, he'd always come back to yes, 
which was remarkable to me in those moments because it showed the love that he had for the band that that he started ages ago with John, you know, back in the day. And he, he was, he never left it and he wasn't going to leave it, you know, right up to the end. He was just hanging on to the dream of it. And he really kept reiterating, you know, keep this going and, and, you know, do me proud kind of language, if you will, yeah. I don't remember verbatim, but those were the sentiments of it. And it was just a surreal time because, you know, on one hand he's going and it was breaking my heart. And on the other, he's telling me, keep going. You know, it's, it's, it's a very, it was a very emotional time, but those were the sentiments of those kinds of conversations back then, you know? I mean, I mean bearing that in mind, given, uh, you know, Chris's desire for this band to continue on and uh, for it to continue with you uh, uh, in his shoes, so to speak, do you get frustrated with the, with people feeling uh, the criticizing this new lineup? at all no it, it's hard you know how the internet is uh, you yeah. know if, if you look you look at your own peril but i've I've been doing it so long and been involved with the social media thing for so long that i've i've learned to have uh, a thicker skin than i may have 30 years ago yeah. <laughs> you know, five years ago whatever it is now um but every now and then if i'm on a thread that's you know discussing this that and the other and it's a positive flow of ideas and then some guy comes in and says you know yes died with chris squire and it should have stopped right there and blah 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 I, I, there's a part of me that like i don't know what it is it's a visceral reaction it's like i just want to say to this guy look i know that's your mindset but just fyi chris squire wanted the exact opposite of that yeah and with all due respect to you I, i'm going you know what i mean i'm doing this <laughs> so for chris for me for for yes legacy and hopefully to do it right in the future and all those things but you know honoring chris's wishes was paramount in my career path once he asked me to do it in 2015 i kind of dropped everything and started just doing this yeah 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 i mean and this album is a a real step i i personally think it's a real kind of step up you know as if it was a you know a f you to all the doubters really when you produce this album yeah well uh, steve did a great job of pulling all these ideas together and and you know we all tried as individuals to bring our energy to it and and just you know sort of blow on those embers and get a bit of flame going again you know so hopefully it, it's and and i believe that this next record that we're working on now is moving in the same direction excellent i'm very admirers yeah so yeah. four, uh, four sides, one track per side. That's what we're going to get, is it? <laughs> we're going to do five just to see if we can get one louder on that one. <laughs> yeah, I think you should do. No, I mean, I, I, the feel I get is uh, is we all want these long, epic, uh, sort of meandering prog numbers again, really. Is, is yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Well, it's a funny thing when you're writing music. I've said this so many times, and, and you know, I know the other guys kind of feel the same way. You, you kind of start writing a song and, and you see where it goes. And, you know, you're not really looking at your watch so much thinking, okay, it's got to extend to 22 minutes, come hell or high water. If it feels good at that juncture and, and it's uh, that's the piece of art you've made, you sort of leave it be, you know. And on the mirror, there are those tracks that expand quite long. And, and then there's some songs for me where like a song like Cut from the Stars, it's just kind of short, sweet and and punches right through everything. So I think that hybrid of having all that stuff on an album is, is, is still remains a classic yes tradition, you know? Yeah. What's the, what, what, do you, what, what was the most challenging uh, bass part uh, of Chris's to play? Well, you know, I knew so much of it and I was so well versed at, at, at all of it that, that I didn't expect turn of the century to just have me <laughs> in my head for a good week usually you know i'll sit down and sort something out make a few notes it's in my head got it um especially because you know as a kid i played to these records over and over and over and over which probably helped yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but turn of the century was this delicate little bass part that was every single note had this harmonic value content meaning in the composition that I know it meant a lot for Chris because we used to discuss that. And, you know, I, I would say to him that I, I know that part, but I don't want to learn it. It's it's a lot. Yeah. But I finally had to do it. And it took me about a week, but I really studied it, made this chart for myself where I could really see what was happening musically and understand it in a different way. And now it's it's become one of my favorite things to play on stage. And it 
it was kind of the most challenging to sort out out of all the things, which is kind of a strange thing to think, given all the crazy bass lines Chris has played. Yeah. It's just one of those things where it's like it's more orchestral in its composition. So you can't, you know, and a lot of things that go by in a night as I play, I may, you know, slide around here and there and paint just outside the lines, but, you know, remain in the lines enough that we know what's going on, but paint outside of it a bit creatively. In this song, you really can't. It's like an orchestral piece. You have to play these notes to make everything else work. And the geometry of the music, the way it comes together is just really remarkable. And it's, it's an epic yes song. I love playing it. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, Chris uh, doffs his cap to John Entwistle, who I think yeah. is uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, yeah. um, I, I don't know, it's probably the first time I've ever heard the bass sound like a lead instrument was those Who records. Yeah, well, those bass strings were just ratty and in your face, <laughs> and, like bright, you know. I mean, that I'm drawn to that type of bass sound, you know, so I, I completely can relate to where Chris's love of Entwistle was, you know. And, it's funny, and like, you know, the Who... Uh, the elements of the who it just seems like a complete mess that shouldn't work really but it just somehow does beautifully you know it's... in a weird way you know ant whistle uh, was a driving force in who that just kept that train on its tracks in a in a way that chris kind of applied to a yes kind of mindset where the bass is just driving through this whole thing while all this other stuff's going down you know absolutely <laughs> if i'm not mistaken the track open um the tracks from open your eyes were actually written for conspiracy is that right and that is a sort of a rumor. Uh, there, there was really only one song in there, which is Open Your Eyes, that we nicked from um, what we were calling then the, the conspiracy uh, or Chris Squire experiment, which turned into conspiracy. And Open Your Eyes, which the label heard and thought, let's we would like to investigate this song further. So we sort of did our version of it on Yes. But all the other stuff was written in the moment. You know, and it, it came out of a... Uh, moment where yes had just broken up in my studio as i was mixing keys to ascension 2 literally john got a phone call i was sitting there with chris and john was on the couch on my left and phone rings john grabs it i stop the tape let him talk and i can see something's wrong gets off the phone and said is everything okay he said rick just quit i'm going home so he <laughs> quit. and it was just me and chris sitting in the studio just scratching our head they were bound for a tour like a couple of weeks later, you know, was things were moving, and it just kind of came to this weird, abrupt stop. And at that point, I kind of looked at Chris because I'd been around Yes enough to see this revolving door happening in person. Yeah. And I said, "Man, we—I I personally can't have Yes breaking up in my studio and that be the <laughs> end of this. This is not my fate. <laughs> Please, we've got to do something." So we just started writing material. And not really for yes, but just out of this desire to write and, and see what would happen. And it, it, as I said before, it was sort of like whatever we were writing felt yes-like enough to, to play it for Alan, who went, oh, man, I want to play on that. Came to my studio and played everything, drums. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, should we send it to John? So, you know, so we just started sending things around and it evolved into what it evolved into, you know. And uh, the only little trick, that came at the end was they thought I was going to be the keyboard player live. I said, guys, you know, <laughs> I can fake it in the studio at the best of them, but I, I am not that guy. You know, a man's got to know his limitations, as Clint Eastwood said. I, that's not my role, but I'm involved. I, I played a lot of the rhythm guitars on this as I was writing it, you know, and so I don't know. I'm happy to play rhythm guitar and go on the road, you know, and they, they'd asked me into the band and it was just a matter of, well, we thought you were the keyboard player. <laughs> 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 who told you this so we got igor and formed that unit you know but getting back to your question all those tracks were written in in that brief little span of time right after keys to ascension kind of band yeah. dissolved and chris and i just sort of grabbed the wheel because the car was sort of going off the rails you know yeah 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 i mean the um uh, the track More We Live, Let Go, was that a number that was specifically written for Union or was it something you just had in the can? That came out of, that was actually the first song Chris and I ever wrote. And subsequently we wrote a bunch of others. During that period, Anderson Bruford and Wakeman Howe are on Arista. And I'm working with Chris Allen and Tony Kay. Um, Trevor wasn't really around a lot. And we started working on material and one thing leads to another and they asked me to be the lead singer of yes 
which came through Derek Shulman, who'd signed my band World Trade and said, Chris, let me introduce you to Billy, blah, blah, blah. So fast forward to getting like more serious about all this and, and everybody wanted me to do it except me. I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to step in front of this oncoming train. I could see this union thing in my head. Chris used to call it the yes crystal ball that I had, but I could see it coming. You didn't have to be a psychic. I knew what was coming up and I just didn't want to get in the way of that train. So I told Chris, don't want to do it. Won't do it. But happy to be involved. If, if there's a place for me in the core, uh, let me know what you want me to do, you know? So one thing leads to another. That album's getting, the songs are coming together. And more, the more we live popped up as a contender. And I got a call from Chris. Hey, come down to the studio, work on this with us. We're going to, but by then Chris and I had really recorded everything. We just transferred the tape off my uh, 16 track at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Started making the record from there, you know, and, and, it was a strange transition because I, I I was involved with that record and there's also a record an album uh, the box set called Yes Years which you'll find a couple of other tracks that come from that era of what was going on in Yes history you know. Well, it's funny a lot of a lot of those Yes guys always talk about uh, Union as being a bit of a car crash. Yeah. Like the whole thing. Rick Wakeman uh, says he calls it Onion because it brings tears to his eyes. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, it was the vibes were. I mean, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It wasn't a walk in the park, hanging out. You know what I mean? At the studio. It was, it was tough work. But I was very young, and I didn't know as much as I knew about Yes, I would come to know. Right. So I was naive, for the lack of a better word, about what was going on. I, you know, I didn't never imagine it would be what it was. But I was smart enough to know that this is not my career path. I just come out of world trade, and I wanted to do more, and I went on and did more. So it wasn't my time then to do that with yes, but it seems from that point forward, it's always come back to me, you know, my phone will ring and it's like, Hey man, can you do this? Do you, we need you for this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And I've always answered the call, you know, cause it's my favorite band. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Um, how did you feel about Geddy Lee playing bass for yes at the rock and roll hall of fame? Um, there were a lot of dynamics going on at that point, And, you know, the vibes weren't great between camps. Uh, you know, I'd leave it at that. And there was some serious politics involved that yeah. I can't really get into. Um, but we saw what happened there. Um, I can tell you, you know, when I went to watch it and I, I went to the green room where, uh, you know, we were, it's two different camps, two different green rooms. Uh, <laughs> we were in our green room and Getty was hanging out there and I'd never met Getty. He's a, I'm a huge fan, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I see him I'm like, and I walk up to him and I say, hi, Getty. I'm such a huge fan, Billy Sherwood. And he, and he see, he's, especially he says, he goes, why aren't you doing this? <laughs> and I said, in a word, politics, you know, in, do have fun, just go for it. So that's about as much as that story as I care to convey, but you can, you can imagine what was going on. Anyone who knows yes and yes history can imagine what was going on. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, how big a deep purple fan are you? I'm, I'm digging deep purple. I've, I've always <laughs> been deep purple. You know, my brother was a huge deep purple fan. So I heard that growing up all over the house a lot. And you know, obviously, smoke on the waters. Uh, you know, on the waters, a classic. And and I, I live in Vegas now when I'm not in the UK, and it's on the radio twenty four seven over there. So it's so funny because you know, as I'm driving around, I, I was thinking, oh, man, it'd be cool to do some gigs with these guys. These guys are cool. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, that we get this opportunity to do what we're doing, which is you know, it's, it's amazing. Absolutely. They've got, they've got some great songs. The keyboards, you know, the way the organs blended with the guitars and it be, oops, and it became a sound was just like it, it, you you knew it was deep purple the minute you heard it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got one I've got one last question for you. It's a question I ask everybody. Um uh, and that is uh, Frank Zappa said uh, jazz isn't dead, it just smells funny. Uh, <laughs> given with, with rock and roll now, you've got bands miming and singing to backing tracks. How healthy is rock and roll, in your opinion? Well, it depends on who you're looking at, because there's still a lot of people who, as I say, play by hand, you know, and 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 more power to them, because that's what real music is about, as we know, you know, and, and we're all creative. We can all use samples of this, that and the other and hit one button and make it do this, that and the other. I mean, I can't believe how old I sound saying this now, yeah. but 
you know, I've done all that. I understand it. But there's something about playing with a band that is unlike any other and, and playing and singing, going for it. And, you know, to, to be fair, some nights not sounding so good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. I had a lot yeah. of fun tonight. I <laughs> missed that part. Um, but it's it's definitely something that we take real seriously and try to do as best as we can. And I was very proud when we played in Japan last tour, Jay Shellen had some uh, friends from some uh, company, drum company come. And the guy says to Jay, I was standing next to him in the green room. The guy says to Jay, you guys are so tight. The tempos are so nailed. I mean, it was, so so when you run to the computer like that, how do you monitor the click? And Jay looks at him and goes, what? <laughs> well, when you guys are playing to the, so we don't we don't play the sequences. We're just going for it. And the guy goes, well, no. Okay, okay. so the music's being played. Yeah, but, but the vocals, obviously. How do you keep the vocals in time from the computer? And Jay looks at me and I said to the guy, we're singing, <laughs> especially what we're doing. So I thought that was that was like a lot of the highest compliment you could receive for exactly what we're talking about, which is like, you know, for me, the real art of music is is the you know tactile thing that happens of people playing instruments, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I say show, you know, I'd, I'd rather see them playing live 100%, even if they mess up occasionally. You just know that it's a live experience, really. I mean, and you know, as, as a Yes fan, one of my favorite things to do was go find the bootlegs where they screwed up because I couldn't believe they could be possibly ever do that. <laughs> there's, there's a few records that I have where Relayer comes completely, Gates of Delirium comes completely off the tracks for like two bars. And it's chaos. Yeah. And it brightens itself. And, and we used to just sit there and put the needle back and go, oh my God, listen to that, man. They actually <laughs> can make a mistake, you know? So I, I enjoy trying to be in that world of perfection. It's not easy and it's stressful sometimes because, you know, but um, you, you do your best and, and every night you go out there, you just do your best, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll just reiterate that the Classic Tales of Yes tour uh, actually kicks off on the 15th next month, isn't it? Next month? Uh, yes, I believe so. I so. In, in in Lisbon, uh, tickets are available. Um, I'm hope hopefully I'm going to catch the Birmingham show here in the, in the UK, and I'll put a link just below this video. Uh, Billy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for chatting to me, and uh, you have a fabulous day. Thank what, you. Take care. What time is it where you are at the moment? Well, it's the same time for you, I believe, because I'm in London. <laughs> Okay, oh, you're <laughs> London time then. <laughs> anyway, yeah. th thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, man. I appreciate it. All the best, mate. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Ciao. Ciao.